These in the gene keys are an update of the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching, and it's meant to be used in a similar way. It's meant to be used as a tool of contemplation to see yourself in your life from a larger perspective. And what he does so brilliantly is he's, he synthesizes all these wonderful wisdom traditions together into this giant body of work, which is the book. And each key represents a different archetypal aspect of the universe of consciousness. And also, since we are the universe and we are nature ourselves, so it has a psychological and a spiritual component as well. I'm Casey Main, a jaded, hopelessly romantic, health-conscious party girl searching for meaning. And my mission is simple, to make life better for myself and for you. I believe real change always comes from within. And the Better You podcast was born to discover hidden parts of ourselves and our stories. A safe place where we have real, honest conversations with people from all walks of life to help better understand ourselves so we can become better versions of ourselves. So come along on this journey of discovery with me so you can become a better you. Welcome back to part two of our conversation with Paul. In this part, we talk about the Gene Keys system and he reads some of my Gene Keys profile. So if you haven't already, I highly recommend you go to genekeys.com and get your own profile so that you can follow along and have a better idea of what we're talking about. Plus, it's just super, super interesting stuff. Like you will not regret uh, looking at this profile. It's something that I know... I will be contemplating and learning from probably for the rest of my life. And it's just, it's really cool stuff. So definitely look yours up so that you can kind of listen along and get an idea of how to read it. All right. So that's it. We're going to go ahead and jump right back into this conversation with Paul. Okay. So, um, a, another field that you're, you're into, I don't know if the correct word is you study or you practice or you facilitate though, is this concept of gene keys, which, mm-hmm. so I've done several different personality tests. I've had my birth chart read. Um, I've never heard of gene keys before mm-hmm. though. So what, um, what is it? Okay. So, the gene keys are there. It's an archetypal contemplative system that I've been studying for about seven years. Have you ever heard of the I Ching? Uh, yes. So but... the, the I Ching is a, it's a body of wisdom that comes out of China and no one really knows how old it is, but it, it was supposedly written down maybe 2,500 years ago, but likely much older. And it's called the book of changes. And the book of changes is this wonderful, um, body of wisdom that was used as an oracle, meaning a way to discern deeper meaning in the situations in life. So the leaders in China and generals and sages and people would use the I Ching as as essentially a way to look at situations in their lives, look at situations in society through a new lens. And the, the I Ching is based on 64 hexagrams or 64... I guess, 64 archetypal energies. The I Ching mapped the, the archetypal energies in nature, the patterns of nature, mm. right? And so it was used as this, as this beautiful mirror in this tool. The reason it's called an oracle is because it's, it's essentially a mirror. Like, you know, when you get a tarot reading and it just resonates so deeply? Yeah. It's the same principle. And it's the same principle when you get an astrology reading and it resonates so deeply. It's because it's... It's showing you a, 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 di- a different perspective um, on either who you are, on a situation in your life, a different way to look at something. And so the, the Gene Keys is really just an update and a, of that system. And it was created by a, a wonderful man named Richard Rudd. He's, he's a British mystic and um, he's a poet. And he was very deep into a system that, which also came out of the I Ching called human design mm. yeah, for many years. And then this 
body of knowledge, this spectacular body of knowledge kind of came through him in a, a very mystical way. And that's his story to tell, but you can find it on the internet. But he wrote this, spent many years writing this book and it, it's called the Gene Keys, and the Gene Keys are an update of the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching, and it's meant to be used in a similar way. It's meant to be used as a tool of contemplation. So in order to, to see yourself in your life from a larger perspective, and what he does so brilliantly is he's, he's taken all of these, a lot's happened since the I Ching came into this world many thousands of years ago. And so all of these, he synthesizes all of these wonderful wisdom traditions together into this giant body of work, which is the book. And each key represents a different archetypal aspect of the universe of consciousness. And also, since we are the universe and we are nature ourselves, so it has a psychological and a spiritual component as well. So the way that you work with the gene keys, and I, it's now been a, close to seven years for me since I really started to dive in, is you use it as a tool to help you see yourself in a, in a deeper way. You simply just invite the material into your life and you begin to contemplate the themes he presents. So an example would be, so each gene key has what is, he, has a, he offers a shadow state or an unconscious state, a gift state or a gift frequency, which is when the unconscious becomes conscious, it unlocks a new awareness and mm -hmm. therefore a gift. And the gift is that new awareness and how that awareness expresses through you. And then there's the highest state, the Siddic state, or the enlightened essence. So like astrology, like human design, you can put in your birthday on the website and you can get a, um, a profile that's based on the location of the planets and, you know, of when you were born. So it's an imprint similar to your astrological chart. You'll have a certain theme that's based on where your sun is. You'll have a key that's where your moon is, all these things. And your job is to simply, it's not, it's to, to study it, but also just to invite the questions of what these, these themes might mean in your own life and begin to contemplate those on your own. So it's a very soft approach to this awakening process. It can be done while you're on your walk at night. It can be done while you're drinking your tea in the morning. It doesn't require you to be a deep meditator. It's this, it's this like lost art of living in the question um, of, of what existence is and what these themes are and how they relate to our lives that creates this opening in ourselves to see ourselves anew and to become aware of patterns that were unconscious before. So it works in this beautiful way of helping us see ourselves in a completely new way. It doesn't give you any prescriptions for like human design is cool and it's great. And it gives you like a prescription, like you should make decisions in this way and do this, this, and this. And it's much deeper. There's a lot to it, but the gene keys are not telling you you should be or do anything. They're telling you to simply, you know, ask the question, like, for example, one, a shadow in one of the keys, a shadow in my life's work of the gene keys for me is the shadow of oppression right? That's like my, the big shadow of my life and feeling oppressed or oppressing others in my behavior. It's an unconscious thing. So it's, for me, that's taken the, that's looked like my supreme dislike of any authority figures, particularly male wow. authority figures. And I've always had this my entire life and I've never really understood. I've just like really disliked male authority figures. And so as I began on this journey, I started to contemplate and just inviting myself to notice where I feel oppressed by others. And I started to see this pattern of like, when I would be around a strong male figure, I would have this sense of like anger and aggression towards them. And I like couldn't listen. I would be reactive. I would be pugnacious. I'd just be like not a kind person. And it would be triggered simply in the presence of the archetype of a strong male figure. And then I would become oppressive towards them. And so by contemplating how that theme might show up in my life, not even saying this, this has to be a shadow in my life because it's in my chart, but just asking the question, how does oppression maybe show up in my life? I started to see it everywhere. And over time, I would notice it so quickly that I would stop engaging with it. And therefore, I would break that cycle in the, in the moment, in real time. And that gave way to this ability to essentially... And the gift of this key is transmutation, to transmute um, that energy in real time and then be able to actually show up and realize that 
that sense of oppression was actually my projection onto another person when they weren't really doing anything. It was my, it was my stuff. I was putting on them. So that's one example of how it works. And then the profile has all these different spheres, which represent different aspects of your life. And so you go on this journey over time and it's a slow journey. You can go fast or go slow of simply asking the question of how these energies might show up in your life. And you'll be amazed at what you find and what happens inside of you and what changes. It's spectacular how it works. So are you, are you supposed to look at it kind of like your life in, well, I guess I'm going to answer my own question here, probably like your life in general, but then also in specific scenarios. So I know like when you do tarot card readings, like sometimes like think of like a question, you know, before you do a poll or something like, Mm -hmm. is it to be used in, in, in really specific scenarios or more kind of a, a bigger picture of life? I think it's good to start more with a bigger picture of understanding yourself um, more generally, Uh, but it can be used in the other way. Um, But it's good. Richard's created a beautiful process where you go through first, uh, the first sequence within your chart is about understanding your genius and the themes that relate to your your personal perfection, your personal genius that you're meant to hear to share. Right. And learning how to like really embody that and work through the challenges that might stand in the way of you really owning that. And then it goes into the second sequence, which is really about how do I, how do I understand the wounding of my heart and heal that so that I can show up with full love to myself and to my relationships. And then the final sequence is called the pearl. And the pearl is about once you've understood your genius and you've opened your heart, you can be of such deep service to the world. And it's about understanding the best way for you to be of service and how you work well with people. So it's, it's both general and also incredibly practical. And it kind of also sounds like it helps explain why we are the way we are. It does very well. And it's also important not to remember, this is all archetype. So it's, a, it's, about, it's about noticing like patterns of energy within our psyche. So, you know, we can very easily attach to the story that, you know, for me, I'm going to actually look at your chart for a moment, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a good idea. Cause that'll that okay? be it's enough, enough about me. Let's talk about you. Yeah. Um, well, that'll be the easiest way to explain it. And we'll just use me. As exactly. <laughs> so, well, it's almost your, it's, it's, I know you have a birthday coming up, so that's exciting. You get to have this. Yes, when thing. this air, it'll be Tuesday and my birthday is, will be Thursday. So it's going to be a little, it might be a, to the people listening, it might be a little strange because I'm going to say a lot of things and it's really much easier when you can see the chart, but I'll do my best to ex- explain um, your, your chart. And you just tell me if you have any questions, you want me to stop as I talk, let me know, but I'll just give you a little, a little snippet or overview. Okay. So, um, and it, you have the chart on, on your end, so just pull it up so you can kind of see what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. So. The first, you'll notice that at the very top, you have a sphere called your life's work. And the life's work is essentially, remember, this is, this is pulled from the, the, your, your birth chart, uh, your, like your astrological chart. So the themes that you have and the mix of themes you have are going to be very different than someone, say, born in September, like me. So it's very unique and very specific. And you'll notice that within each sphere, there is... Uh, the two, there are two numbers. There is a first number, which represents the gene key in that sphere. So this, the gene key in the sphere of your life's work is the 23rd gene key. And then after that, there's a decimal point and another number. That other number is what's called a line. And a line can be numbered one through six. And they just simply rub. If you're a line six with a 23rd gene key, you'll express the themes of that gene key differently than if you're a line one or a line two point is it's a permutation and a way of expressing that's different so you could have the 23rd gene key which is quintessence and the the sixth line and you'll express very differently than if you had the 23rd gene key and the line one and i'll get into what that all means but that's important to understand so the the chart is really a journey through understanding yourself it's a process of self-illumination and it works really well. I can't, I can't tell you enough how well it works. Um, and your job is again, simply to invite 
in the contemplation of these ideas and to, to, to invite yourself to notice them in your life. So let's, let's start with your life's work. So your life's work is actually, I'm going to back up. We're going to start with your personality type. Okay. And you're what's called a 6-2 personality. So you'll notice you have a, a 6 in your life's work and your evolution, which is the next, and then you have a 2 in your radiance and a 2 in your purpose. You're what's called a 6-2 personality type. And the, the line 6 in your life's work has the keynote of the teacher. And you're meant to share something with the world. And you're meant to share it by being, becoming a role model. Your life is moving you towards and learning to embody and becoming a role model of something. In this case, for you, it's the, the essence of quintessence, which I'll describe in a moment what that means. Because like, what the heck does that mean? I don't, I don't know. That I know. Word. I know. So it's like a, it's a pretty rarefied word. But so this is the energy of the teacher, right? And the energy of the line six. They're, first of all, the person with the line six has three phases in their life. The first phase will be the first 28 years of their life. And that's a, that's a period of a lot of experimentation, a lot of trying on new hats, for example, um, trying new things, learning by doing. And after the Saturn returns at around 30, that shifts into a new phase of your life. And that's the phase of kind of stepping back and becoming more observant about the world around you, your own behaviors and the world around you. And the purpose of that second phase, which is like this, this moving more inward phase is to understand the world more deeply. And what happens in the first phase of experimentation, the second phase of observation lead to the third phase, which is really where life life culminates for you. So people with a 6-2 profile, they tend to, their great work comes later in life, mm -hmm. around age 50, when the Chiron returns. Say, when's it, when is this happening? <laughs> so it's, it's, you're not going to be doing great things until then. But all those, all those great things you're going to be doing are going to be in service of that big, that wisdom that you're going to be here to share around that time. So you're gathering, gathering, gathering wisdom. People with the line six tend to have a more objective view of the world. They see, they can kind of see, they see the vision. They have vision. They, they can see where things are going. They, they tend to have deep dreams about where they're going. And it's very important for someone with a line six to constantly surrender and get out of the way of that dream and to let that dream die. So a new dream can be reborn as they keep collecting more information. So you're in a constant process of education. You're like constantly educating yourself. You're learning, learning, learning. Um, and the, I guess the unconscious or the, the low frequency energy of the line six can be um, someone who is a bit aloof or a bit arrogant or thinks they know everything and then and feels alienated or like misunderstood like people don't really get them and then the the highest expression of the line six is like wise and approachable you mm. you hold wisdom and remember you're you teach through becoming a role model at later in your life so you might be a type of person that people come to for a lot of advice in your life um so the other aspect of the personality type is the, the line two. The line two is called the dancer. And the reason it's called that is because it's about, it's about being in flow. It's about following your passions. It's about getting out of your own way. It's not, it's not about overthinking. It's about following the passions and the things that like would light you up and draw you in life and draw, draw you, draw you in like a moth to a flame. And so the line two, they're the type of person that goes to a party. And when they get to the party, they have no interest in working the room. They find one person <laughs> and they have a very, very deep conversation with that person. Most likely they thrive on very deep, intimate relationships and conversations. Yes. They and do, that's really tough at parties because really those are all about small talk. And in my phase one, I was great with small talk because I was usually drunk. Now and you in my phase it. two, I hate small talk. Exactly. And I and, hate that I hate it. 
And so it's important to learn to honor that about you. And it's also important to learn line two is there's a hermit energy here. They, they need a lot of alone time and they need to learn. They need to learn to be okay with needing that alone time and to express that. Like you're just not going to feel as social as your friends. And often when you let's, I use the party as an example, let's say you go to a party, you're often going to feel like an alien at the party. Like there's going to be that, like you stand off to the edge for a little while to like get your, to like ground into like what's happening. And then like, you'll go in and you'll find that person, but there's, you become a a little bit less social over time. Yes, that has totally happened. And I think people in my life have a hard time understanding that. I've totally accepted it, but it is still, I will notice it and be like, wow, like I'm, I'm like, I guess I'm an introvert. I always thought I was an extrovert, but maybe I'm an introvert, but I, I have recognized that I do need my alone time. Yeah. And that's, that's all in service. So that, that hermit quality and that following the passion and then that constant study is in service of the wisdom you're here to share later in your life. Okay. So it's about really honoring that part of yourself. And with the line two, it's important to communicate your need for that space. And a lot of people know it's not personal. Um, I'm also a six two, so I resonate really deeply with it. Um, Okay. Let's talk about your life's work though, for a moment. Okay. And so you have the shadow of complexity and mm. you have the gift of simplicity. And finally, you have the city of quintessence. So let me ask you a question. Okay. When I say the word complexity, what does that bring up in you? Um, maybe that I, that I like overthink things. Like I'm making things more complicated than they need to be. Yes, that's definitely part of it. So (laughs) absolutely. Um, As as we kind of talked about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 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 This is the great challenge. And it's the mind's need to figure out and control the world around it in order to feel safe leads us into this realm of complexity. And the mind that was, we talked about earlier in the podcast loves to create meaning. Mm-hmm. So it's getting caught in this cycle of constantly trying to create meaning and trying to figure things out. And what that leads to is, is like a, a mistiming in your ability to communicate. You, it's like you, how do I describe it? So complexity is this, this thing that you're, you're so in your head and you, there's also a belief that people like naturally understand what you're thinking. It's like this unconscious thing that people like know what I'm thinking. So when you try to communicate it, it comes out like sometimes like jumbled or not fully, like it doesn't feel fully thought out or it doesn't feel, um, there's something mistimed and misaligned with the communication when you're in that state. Yes. And that like people can't connect to what you're saying. And and that's just part of, that's part of that mind's tendency to like, one, assume that people know what it's thinking and two, that, that obsession with trying to figure things out. Right. So the gift of simplicity is like, it's moving into the state and into this noticing, first noticing that quality in yourself. And in noticing that you can just like allow the mind to like calm down. But your, your great gift of your life is to take the complex and to make it simple and communicate it to people. You're the great translator and the great translator of the complex. And how wonderful is that? And so it's about learning to see the beauty in simplicity. And the more, the more you simplify your life, the more you get clear on your thinking and on your thoughts, the easier life becomes. And you know, there's, there's a thread of Buddhism in this, in this key, in the gene keys. It's all about right action and mm-hmm. knowing about how to take the right action. And the more simple we get and the more clear we get within ourselves, the more we just naturally take the right action in our lives. And these people tend to be, you have the line of the teacher, but these two people tend to be the great teachers of the world because they can so elegantly take what's complex and make it simple for people to understand. And I'll pause there for a moment. Any thoughts on that? No, I, I love that. Um, I've heard that before and 
That's something that I have recently recognized within myself is the ability to communicate complex things in in a more simple, easy to understand way. But what I found is, and I was just thinking about this the other day, actually, it's easier for me to do that when I'm writing versus speaking. And I think, I, I maybe I'm overthinking this, that sometimes my, because writing forces me to slow down my thoughts enough to really kind of get them out versus as I'm talking, my brain is still kind of moving in another direction. And then that's where maybe I'm thinking, oh, people know what I'm thinking and kind of then jump to another sentence. And then maybe it doesn't make sense. Totally. And the, the beautiful thing is about the process of writing forces simplicity. And mm-hmm. the, the quality of your mind will be reflected in how you speak always. So if your mind is chaotic, your language becomes chaotic. So th- th- what's, in, what's in the words and in the frequency and in the vibration and like the cadence or the intonation of the words, people are responding to that in a deeply subconscious level. So if the tonality and the intonation of your words is reflecting a chaotic state of mind, then people can't hear you, even if you're clear. Ah. So... So the simplicity is, about, so you, the, the beautiful thing is that you write. So that writing slows you down. It gets you clear. And when your mind is clear, your, your speaking becomes clear. And when your speaking becomes clear, you can penetrate people with your words. And you can get through the original name in the I Ching of this, of this key or hexagram was called splitting apart. So your, your words have this ability to like shatter the illusions that people have through your, through your vibration. That's that, that's like the great gift that you have. So in your writing, so the more you cultivate an awareness of how the chaotic state of your mind um, gets in the way of you effectively communicating, and you can start to just like simplify, simplify, simplify. And that also means in your actions in your life. Like, how do you simplify your life? This pandemic's a wonderful way to simplify our lives. It's a great way to really ask the question of how do I create more and more simplicity in my life externally, my relationships, my work, my, uh, my speech. And you'll start to notice all the ways that that shadow of complexity kind of muddles things. And in simply in noticing that, you'll then have the ability to make new choices. And then when you make new choices, you create a new reality. And that's the magic of how the keys work. So just asking the question of what does simplicity mean to me? What does complexity mean? How do these things show up in my life? And then the highest state is an enlightened essence, quintessence, right? Quintess- quintessence, my understanding of this is it's like the the essential essence of, of all things, like the deepest essence, right? The, that essence that's beyond words. And when you're in this highest state of quintessence, like you are an embodiment of just like the essence of being, right? These are the enlightened states. These aren't things that you can like really work towards. I don't know, like, wow. So is that what I'm going to be like when I'm 50? <laughs> you might, you, who knows? Maybe. I mean, you, you you know, you told me earlier that before we got on the call that you've been really drawn to these practices like Buddhism, for example, mm-hmm. when you get download this book and someday, and I know you will, and you read that chapter, it's all about Buddha, the entire thing. Mm-hmm. It's about, I read one of your articles on that you were linked to on uh, yoga or something. Yogi was, approved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yogi approved. And you were talking about the noble truths. And I was just like, I was laughing when I read that because I had looked at your chart and seen that you had that key. And of course you're drawn to that. Yeah. So. Oh, fascinating. So let's, let's, let's pause on that key for a moment and let's move on to your evolution, which is the next one. Remember, this is a journey. Mm -hmm. So the evolution, the pathway, there's like a line that connects the two. And the pathway from your life's work to your evolution represents the greatest challenge of your life. So the themes in your evolution are going to be like the pain in your butt. And the shadow of your evolution is the 43rd gene key. And it's the shadow of deafness. Mm. 
I love this one. Um, the shadow of deafness is, it's not deaf in the, it, the, both of these keys are very acoustic because they're about language. They're about, they're about what people hear. They're about what you hear. And deafness is not the inability to hear. It's the inability to hear your truth above all of the noise in the world. Mm. There's so much noise and there's so many expectations and there's so many, so much conditioning of what you think you should do, but people tell you you should do what the world tells you should do. You're so distracted by that, by all that noise that you become completely deaf to your own inner world. You can't hear that deep current that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So the shadow of deafness and so in that deafness that's connected to complexity, they create a feedback loop, right? So in your inability to hear, there's like this, like you, you're like, you can't hear what's true for you. So you're like, you go into the world and you're like trying to figure it out. And there's so many, so many voices and so many things. And that, that creates so much complexity and stress, which then feeds like the sense that there's more to figure out, which feeds that deafness even more. And it creates this loop of these two, these two binaries that are of energy that are keeping you from being able to hear yourself and to get simple in your life, to get down mm -hmm. to the, the truth of what you're here to do. So the gift of insight is still deaf, but it's deafness flipped. Insight is becoming deaf to all of the noise of the outside world mm -hmm. and tuning in to that inner voice and like not listening to anything in that outer world, becoming completely deaf to it. And when you do that, your life becomes much, much, much simpler. And you begin to hear the current of what you're here to share and to express. And the 43rd Gene Key has, is associated really with a lot of creativity. In the book, Richard calls this, this gift, he has titles for all the gifts, and he calls this gift the, the creative rebel. And mm. you become this creative rebel when you stop giving a, I like so want to swear. You stop giving, oh, you can swear. You stop, I don't care. <laughs> you stop giving a shit about what any of the one in the world thinks about. And you only follow that passion of what it is that like lights your heart up. <sighs> okay. And life becomes incredibly simple then because there's like, you're not like, there's no more comparison. There's no more like trying to figure out like what you need to give society. You're just listening to what that, what that, what that calling is inside of you. And eventually that gives way to the highest state, which is an epiphany. And the epiphany is simple. Your epiphany will look different, but ultimately it boils down to this understanding that like, there's nothing to add to yourself. There's nothing to get rid of that. As you are right here and now, you are exactly perfect the way you are. And there is so much freedom in the embodiment of that understanding. And it's very beautiful. So there's so much creativity that's waiting to be unlocked in fully understanding what, how these themes, the shadow gets in the way and how stepping into that gift and just practicing, stepping into it through becoming more aware, the, what's awaiting to just unlock naturally. There's no work to be done. There's only an awareness to be shifted. That's the beauty of how this works. And when it's you change. So then what is this um, over by the evolution bubble, the line six education and surrender? It's still what I was talking about, about the line six earlier. It's the way that you understand and express the 43rd gene key. Okay. So I, I mentioned earlier, it's important that you're going to, you probably have a dream that you keep seeing for yourself. Like you, you kind of know where you're, you feel, you know, where you're going. You can see like your dream of where the world's heading, where you want to go. There's an idealism in in the line six but it's important to constantly surrender to the form to not be attached to the form of what that will look mm -hmm. like okay um and the more you do that the the easier your life will be <laughs> okay and and then and, and and you're gonna the part of so how does it constantly educate and going deeper into this and into into creativity in this example um unlock that understanding of what the 43rd gene key is about for you. So okay. it's like the, like the, the, the expression of the themes of the line six through the understanding of how it, how that manifests within the themes of the 43rd gene key. And you'll get used to doing that. It gets, it's pretty simple, but I would just start with contemplating the gene key. Don't worry about the okay. line right away. Start okay. with the gene key. And then you can do the next one. Okay. But we'll do a few more. 
Um, and we'll go to what's called your radiance, which is on the left side of your chart. And the radiance is really about understanding how you how you keep your mental, spiritual, physical, and emotional well-being intact. And like I said, you're a line two here. The line two is about you need a lot of alone time. You need a lot to, to go inward. You need it's really about cultivating creativity and intimacy with few important people. If you were to give this a yoga practice, I often associate Kundalini yoga with this because it's about really about moving energy. Um, and the the theme in your radiance is this theme of desire as the shadow, a lightness as the gift, and then the highest state is rapture. And we're not going to get into the highest state of rapture is like how do you even describe rapture in words? Right. <laughs> but it's it's like it's very ecstatic. Let's just say that. Um, but the shadow of desire, right? Another very Buddhist idea here, being pulled by the nature of your desires. This is really the cycle of craving and aversion, chasing more of the things that feel good and denying the things that feel bad. And it's really about being just noticing how you're caught in that cycle. Desire in itself is not bad. It's an evolutionary force. It's good. It drives us. It pushes us in a, in a direction towards our awakening. It's like the the mechanism of our awakening, if we can become aware of what's happening. So often with this, sh with this shadow, we deny our desires. We try to push them away as bad, right? Mm -hmm. But it's about learning to like engage with them and accept them. It doesn't mean necessarily that you um, fulfill all of your desires all the time, because some of your desires, you can honor them and experience them internally, but they don't need to be experienced on the physical plane. So it's about getting in touch with that desire nature and seeing how it, how its waves pull you out of your equilibrium and your balance and learning to not take yourself so damn seriously and to, to be so, <laughs> to be so like, like thrown off and annoyed by them, like to see the, this, this natural desirous aspect of yourself, which is part of all of us as, as humorous and see it with lightness. And learn to like have a light touch with yourself when it comes to these things. Mm -hmm. And that will help really help you find that well-being in yourself. There's much more. So then is the, go ahead. Is the line to marriage, marriage in the traditional sense of the word, or it's more no, like it's, it's representing about, commitment. It's about, it's really about representing like you thrive on intimacy. Right. Like not bouncing around, chasing all my desires. <laughs> yeah, like that, that's important for you. Exactly. So you're, you're, you're kind of getting how the pieces fit together and like, yeah, okay. they're going to fit together. Your interpretation is what's important here. And I'm just a guy pointing at things. The gene keys are a self illumination tool. I can like give you the lay of the land, but the, your job is to like ask yourself how these work. Cause I don't live in your psyche. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's important. And then you're, that's, so you get, you get how you're seeing how that works and like marriage. So what is marriage? Like that can mean, like I said, you love deep, intimate relationships. Most likely I'm just assuming you do. Yes, I do. Um, and so what are your desires around that? You, it's a question to ask. You don't need to answer that now, but these are like the types of questions to ask. How does, how does my judgment of my own desires get in the way? How do I not honor my desires? How do I, how do I honor my desires? How can I honor my desires, but, and still not hurt myself and others? That's like asking those questions are important. Okay. We'll do two more. Okay. But so your purpose, your purpose is really like, it's really like that. I like to think of it as like the essence of your being. It's like, it's your purpose of being, it's like the energy you all kind of unconsciously give off. Right. And you have, it's also the purpose in your mm -hmm. relationships. So, cause it goes into the Venus sequence here. What's so cool about this one is, so when I say, let me ask you this, when I say the term half-heartedness, what comes up for you to be half-hearted? Um, like you're not giving something your all. Mm -hmm. Like you're, um. I guess like you could be doing more or you could yeah. be, yeah, like you could be doing more. Well, if you look at this, the gift frequency here, it's so the highest state, the highest expression of this is devotion, which, oh my God, how beautiful. And the gift state is commitment. 
So there's something in here about in the shadow about inability yeah. to commit. Commit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Why do you laugh there? Well, just um I so I had um Monica Berg on the podcast. She had written a new book called Rethink Love and um which is a kind of a based on Kabbalah principles. But she talked about how if you have this history of relationships um, where you're with unavailable men, technically or emotionally, which I do, she's like that. That kind of points out actually your own fear of totally commitment, and so kind of one of the I forget what the kabbalistic word is for, but that we all have these something with the D things here to learn, and like one of my one of mine is most likely commitment. Yeah, well, it's in a very prominent place in your chart, so a fun one to go into. And the point is that you're half-hearted. If you're not 100% committed to something, if there's even 1% of you that's off, you're in your shadow. You're not committed. Mm -hmm. Commitment is total. And that doesn't mean always to another. It means commitment to yourself, first and foremost. If you can't be committed and devoted to yourself, you can't ever be committed and devoted to others. So often we go out into the world and we find people who let us off the hook by their lack of commitment. So we can be like, well, they're, they're not committed to me. Look at blah, blah, blah. But it's really everything. Like I said, everything is a, a mirror and a reflection. Yep. Yep. So Monica Berg is her name. She's definitely right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. All right. That's interesting. So, and then the highest state of devotion is just like, it's, it's like really a commitment and a commitment to seeing the God in all, seeing God in all things, Mm. seeing love in all things. It's a commitment to love and it's, it's love in action. It's like so beautiful. I love Um, that. Yeah. So, okay. So this moves us into the Venus sequence, which is about love. And we're not going to get too deep into that right now, but I want to, there's in the Venus sequence, it's a, it's a lot about how to open your heart a lot about your wounding. Mm. So the way it works is you go back in time. You start with your relationships and what you attract in. And then you go backwards in time into your teen years, which is when your mental body or your sense of who you are and your sense of self like forms. And then in the next one into the EQ, you move into the, the, the second eight, seven years of your life from eight to 14. When you're your emo- like your hormones are coming online and you're learning how to deal with your emotions and your desires. And then you move into the SQ, which is the next sphere, which is about the first seven years of your life of coming into form, just being born and learning how to use your damn body. And all of those, those cycles, those, those phases, those foundational phases are the developments of parts of aspects of yourself. So you're going back in time into the, to the beginning of your life. You're going through a contemplative journey into from um, adulthood back into the moment of birth and to see how the way that you developed was really developed on this conditioning from earlier phases in your life. So you go through this journey of peeling back the layers into your childhood. And within this sequence, there are wounding patterns. Do you mind if I name yours or is that weird? No, go for it. Okay. So based on the the number after the decimal point in each of the keys in the red sequence, you'll see Mm -hmm. how you have a four in your attraction. Sorry to the people listening. You'll get it when you look at your chart. You have a (laughs) four in your attraction, a three in your IQ, one in your EQ, a six in your SQ, and a four in what's called your vocation. But in the Venus sequence, it's called your core wound. Each of those numbers is correlated to a wounding pattern and you have one particular wound that shows up twice in your venus sequence that i just want to address it's your core wound the wound that you incarnated with it like came with the vehicle it came with casey's Mm -hmm. physical vehicle when she got here it's like came from wherever you came from and and then you have that also in your relationships and it's the wound of rejection I have had said so many times as I've gone, gone in kind of this journey of trying to understand why it was that realizing that I have a big issue with rejection. Like that, that is, 
I'm very aware of that. That's so interesting. Well, according to your chart, it's your, it's the great wound you're here to work through. It shows <sighs> up. It's like the deepest. Yes. And you, so in the gene keys, there's a, there's a key that heals every wound. And you happen to have the key that heals this wound twice in your chart. And it's the 43rd gene key, Epiphany. Uh, so I highly recommend contemplating that gene key and understand. I'll explain how it relates to rejection in a moment. So let me talk about rejection for a moment. Rejection is actually a very ancient tribal wound. We think of it as personal, but it's, it's deeper. So let's go on a, like a little journey back in time to the period when we were, lived more in tribal societies, right? Or in societies where people were less diverse. So in, in a tribal society or in a, a homogenous society, People who are different are threatening, right? So mm -hmm. we, and they were rejected or are made outcasts. So if you were different and you didn't conform to the norms of whatever society you lived in, you were likely kicked out of the group. And that sh almost surely meant death in that period. So it would deep in the recess of the unconscious, there's this wound of if I'm not accepted by my society or my, my group or my family, that just surely spells death for me. It's like a deep unconscious yeah, fear, yeah. right? So you want so badly to be accepted and loved by those around you. So what happens is in that pursuit to be accepted and loved, we end up rejecting ourselves in order mm -hmm. to be accepted by the group. So we become deaf to ourselves the 43rd gene key and trying to become what the group needs. And that is the pro that's when the process of self-rejection begins. So the process of healing our rejection is, you know, can be found in the 43rd gene key of understanding what insight means. It's about learning to become deaf to all of those noises and learning how to not reject yourself by only listening to yourself and following the, the music of your destiny, of your unique path, and, be, and learning to be okay with potentially being rejected by society, that, learning to be okay with that fear. We come into our own sovereignty and our own power. And when we come into our own power and sovereignty, we begin to realize that we were never really able to be rejected by anybody else. We were just simply rejecting ourselves. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, there's nothing to change, nothing to fix, nothing to add, nothing to let go of. And that is the epiphany. And that epiphany is what heals our rejection. Which is like self-acceptance. Self Which is a form of self-acceptance. Wow. That is some spot on stuff right there. Because I, I, okay, it's interesting that I, I came into this world as my, that's my core wound, but it's showing up in relationships. I mean, a hundred percent. That's like what my whole book is about. And then you also have this, then you also happen to have the key of half heartedness, which is like, so the, the fear of rejection and the inability to commit, that's a tough, that's, that's a, a tough and beautiful lesson to learn. So I suspect your relationships are going to be a great source of your healing for you. Yes. Wow. Okay. And so that the, those are like two separate concepts, right? Like I don't have the half heartedness because of the rejection. Those are they're, just two. All, two. All, all of these energies are playing. They're all, we, they're all happening simultaneously. They're not, they're not okay. necessarily causal towards each other, but they interplay. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough interplay right there. That's a tough combo. It's a beautiful opportunity in your it's relationship. It's a beautiful opportunity <laughs> to grow. You're right. <laughs> okay. Now the, and the, the last one I'm going to tell you is, um, the wound of your heart, which is the wound of your SQ. The SQ is like your heart, right? Mm -hmm. So this is this peer, this key is correlated to the first seven years of your life when you're coming into physical form. And it's a line six. And the line six wound is the wound of separation. Mm -hmm. I like to think of this as also maybe the fear of abandonment, fear of being left, or the sense that you're an alien and can't be under, no one understands you, misunderstood. 
which keeps you on the outside. It keeps you as an outsider. So the question is, how does that show up in your, in your relationship to love, both with yourself and with others? And I don't know. That's for you to answer. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. I wonder if that has anything to do with being like a middle child. <laughs> talk about middle child syndrome. <laughs> um, okay. First seven years of my life. Yeah. So just make that an inquiry, mm -hmm. right? And as you go about the process of living your life, you know, the more, like I said, I'll just repeat it one last time. The more that you give energy to just being in the question of what these words represent and how they might relate to your life and your behavior, you'll start to see yourself anew. And in seeing yourself anew, you'll, that's where like the insights and, and epiphanies start to just come out of nowhere. And this is the magic of contemplation. So it goes really well with whatever else you're doing. It's like a great add-on to your meditation or mm -hmm. augmentation to your meditative practices, to all these other studies that we all do. And yeah, so this is a, it's a good place to start. Start with that activation sequence, those first four I talked about. And then um, I'm sure a lot will blossom. I love this. I love, I love the whole, the whole layout and the way it, the way it flows. Like that's, mm -hmm. it, it's very, very interesting. Can people get, or can you figure out, get this profile um, online? Yeah, you can like go on the free? Gene Keys website. It's free. Okay. And then they're highly recommend buying the book um, to start studying. And then on the website, they have self-study courses, mm -hmm. which are really great to help you dig in. And then if you really want to go into your chart, there are people that offer readings, myself which and others. Which you do, right? Which, yes. which okay. I do. And it's a big part of my work. And that's simply just to really help you get a deep sense of some of the themes in your life so to, and to give you some tools to go deeper because it can feel like a lot in the beginning. Yeah, it does. It does feel like a lot. I can <laughs> attest to that. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, just now we know that of my shadow of complexity, my mind wants to immediately kind of attack it all and figure it all out. But 100%, you know, yeah. Okay. Simplicity. I'm going to go for a walk after this and just try and calm down. <laughs> totally. Awesome. Thank you so much thank for, for coming birthday. on and for doing this. Oh, thank you. Tell everybody where they can um, find more about your work and follow sure. you and get in touch with you and all of that. So in regards to my, my work as a sound practitioner, I have a website called soundandself.com. And I, I do, I haven't been able to do much sound work because of the pandemic, but you can go there to find information about doing gene key readings or some personal meditation, breath work, coaching work that I do. Um, I also lead a, a style of practice and a, I built a, a system with my, my partner, Erica, I think it's been on the show yes, and that's called, has, yes. it's called seven senses. And that is experience seven senses.com. And we lead retreats and uh, teach a lot of classes around a lot of these themes. And every Sunday we have a, a, a practice we do with a large group of people. It's online currently. And um, it's a really beautiful way to um, move energy and to really get grounded and get reconnected to yourself when tough things are happening out in the world. So that's where you can find me. And I'm also on Instagram at Paul M. Kuhn. And uh, yeah. Awesome. This is really fun. Thanks, Casey. Yes. No, thank you so much. All right. So that will do it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you are subscribed so you don't miss next week's conversation with Gary Bobroff. It's another really interesting one on archetypes. So if you enjoyed this episode and particularly the gene keys component, then you'll definitely enjoy it next week. And we also have so many incredible guests lined up interviews already recorded. It's like hard for me to just keep them sitting on my computer. I kind of want to air them all, but I'm going to hold off and keep to once a week so that I do not overwhelm you guys. 
If you enjoyed this episode, I hope you will take just a couple seconds to give the podcast a rating and review. It means the world to me. I absolutely love seeing the ratings and then especially the reviews. You don't have to write a novel, just like a short little note, letting me know what you think is just really helpful for me to help me know that I'm kind of on track with what you guys want to be hearing. And it also just helps a lot in the like podcast algorithm world. So, you know, in this world of social media and all things, internet and Google and whatever, it's all algorithm based and you kind of have to play that game and just ratings and reviews help a lot. And so that'll really help me grow the podcast so I can continue to do this. So another reason that I will very much appreciate you taking the time to leave a rating and or write a short review. If you are not already, you can follow the podcast on social media. We are on Facebook and Instagram at the better you podcast. And if you have feedback for me, you can always reach me at the better you podcast at gmail.com. All right. So that is it for this week. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you next week.